Just want to talk about the winter heat program to start with. Uh, more than 10,000 installations of clean heating devices have now been put in place. Um, and that is 7,172 heat pumps. And then uh, 2,835 2, solid uh, burners have been, um, uh, essentially most of them are replacements, but one or two have been repaired flues, etc., to get them back into operation. But that's a very uh, big effort from the PMO office. And that work does continue. It's not continuing at that same pace because the demand isn't there. But last week, uh, someone mentioned to us that uh, they had an elderly relative uh, who was um, without winter heating. Uh, that had not been reported prior to that, but within 24 hours uh, that uh, elderly person had a um, heat pump installed. So calling 0800 damage still works uh, if people have emergency requirements for or immediate requirements for winter heating. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Sarah advised uh, it had received 2,000 824 completed residential red zone consent forms. Uh, that was that, these are the forms that people are asked to send back to Sarah uh, so that the private details can be, or their personal details I should say, and uh, information about their property uh, can be gathered in order to make the uh, purchase offer um, which is coming. I'm happy to say that uh, as of uh, this morning that number has grown to 3,000 583 returns out of 5,100 in just over a, a really less than a fortnight. That's a, an extremely good response rate and indicates, I think, that people are uh, preparing to make decisions and move on with their lives. This week also we announced an extension of the uh, temporary accommodation assistance uh, so that people who are in the red zone uh, or have a property in the red zone, if they have exhausted their um, uh, temporary accommodation provided by the insurer uh, will be able to access on the same basis as, as everybody else uh, the temporary accommodation requirements. As at uh, last week there were around about 100 families who were accessing that assistance. We would expect that to grow as the anniversary of the first event occurs on September the 4th. We also announced that $3.8 million will be made available to assist people with their legal fees uh, when they do accept those offers, those sale and uh, transfer offers, uh, that'll, that will be uh, uh, two capped amounts, $750 and $500, depending on the option that's taken. Uh, and we're also aware that a number of banks are offering to assist with that as well. Uh, the other important news for people is that for those who accept the government's purchase offer, a deposit of the lesser of 50% of the purchase price, in other words, if it's a land a piece of land worth 90000 it would be 45000 but uh, if it's the whole property, then a $50,000 deposit will be paid uh, soon after the agreement is signed. Uh, the settlement date on the property is something that individuals will want to make their own determination about, uh, and we, we're pretty open to when that occurs. The uh, idea of this is that people will get into a position very quickly that will enable them to make ongoing purchases or uh, to respond to um, uh, the opportunities for new housing, uh, which Roger's going to talk about more on shortly. As we've detailed before, uh, the, uh, there is now an indicative timeline for decisions in the orange zone. Um, it would be our hope that those timelines can be shortened, uh, but I want to caution again that it's very important that we get it right. Uh, there's, uh, uh, but it is a big decision, it's very important for a lot of people. Um, and uh, the, I want to confirm that the work is ongoing. It's working. It's going at a pace uh, that is that is uh, as fast as possible, um, and the uh, priorities for those areas uh, remains exactly the same. I just want to make a comment before I uh, move off the land issue on the issue of land supply. What I am detecting is a degree of slowness in the uh, existing processes uh, for land consenting. And I'd like to reiterate uh, that there is um, little willingness uh, to tolerate undue delays. The government expectation is that uh, where people have made applications for uh, residential land to be made available for residential, for, for residential subdivision, 
uh, that those consenting processes should move as quickly as possible uh, without the uh, sort of delays that business as usual might bring. We would hope that people, are, that those who have responsibility in this area uh, will, will be able to move things a bit more quickly than appears to be the case at the moment. Um, it was disappointing this week, I think, to see that unemployment has risen slightly in Christchurch. It's still about 1% below the national average. Um, but I would expect that uh, as, as we see uh, more and more recovery work getting underway, uh, that the uh, demand for jobs or that the demand for uh, people to work in the city will rise. We already have uh, observed um, advertising for jobs in the city of being ahead of the rest of the country. Uh, and we would expect that to ramp up over a period of time. The one thing that is clear is that the dire predictions that were made about the employment situation in Canterbury back in February uh, have not come anywhere near uh, to bear. Uh, and we would hope that this is a, a, a downward blip uh, rather than a trend. Um, I want to just conclude my remarks uh, by saying that the SARA organisation continues to grow in strength um, and I think the uh, uh, focus that, that it is developing around the recovery uh, is becoming clearer for people. Uh, Roger's going to talk about some of the, the more successful public interactions uh, and then some of the, the more obvious uh, um, expressions of uh, recovery that are, that are out there, uh, mainly demolition. Uh, but by and large, I think uh, this organisation is very much on track uh, and is establishing itself as a can-do body um, and uh, showing the sort of leadership that we would expect. Um, we'll also have an update from, uh, from EQC, but I'll hand over now to Roger. Thanks, Minister. We had a very uh, successful housing expo last weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we had something like 15,000 people um, through the doors of our expo, um, where there were something like 70 different exhibitors from people selling land, property, um, insurance companies were there, banks were there. Um, and I think it gave people a very good feel about what was going on out there. And I think people really appreciated being able to talk to people face to face and get information. For a lot of these people, they've never thought they'd be, you know, buying another house. And to put it all in one place, I think, really worked very, very well. We, assert, we see ourselves, we see, um, ourselves having a lot more of those sort of things, um, having them tailored more to particular groups. So, you know, are we going to have one for, you know, the elderly or all those sort of things? where people can get messages that they actually um, are tailored very much for them. But also the other thing that, we, that was seminars, so people got to talk to experts who gave them sort of independent advice, so we've got more of that coming. We're also going to build a, um, a hub um, in the middle of um, that first red zone area, which hopefully we'll tell you about more about next week. So that'll be like a mini version of that expo, but also like a one-stop shop where people can get information. So we think that's sort of getting out of the community where people can um, get information directly, but also they can meet other people in a similar situation where they can get, talk to each other about what they're going to do, I think it's going to be really successful. Um, we're doing a lot of work just on the labour market, um, trying to understand about what we need to do to ensure more people are trained, um, to, um, if you like, meet the, the labour demand that's coming. Clearly there's going to be thousands, tens of thousands of people needed for the rebuild, and there's a lot of work going on between ourselves, with unions, um, with polytechs, um, with businesses, with the construction industry, to try and understand exactly what that demand is going to be. Um, we think that demand is probably going to be peaking sort of 18 months, two years away, but there's a lot of work going on at the moment by a lot of people to try and make sure um, we've got a really good picture of what we need to do. Um, infrastructure, just generally in infrastructure, I mean, while, we are, while the ramp up's going on, we, the rate of spending at the moment in Christchurch is still about three or four times what you'd normally be spending in Christchurch on infrastructure, on fixing stuff. There's about a thousand guys out there at the moment and that work continues to ramp up. By sort of this time next year, it'll be running at maybe five times the normal rate would normally run, be, you know, would normally run it, so they're, they're big numbers. But there's a lot of work going on out there in terms of the roading, in terms of the water, in terms of the sewerage, and um, you know, that's, that's gonna take a while. And I was gonna suggest maybe Warwick would gonna step up here and talk a bit about the demo stuff. Just a, a quick update on demolitions. I know you've got the statistics from a couple of days ago. So as at Wednesday this week, 553 properties have been approved uh, 
for make safe, partial or uh, full demolition. Just a little over 460 letters have gone out uh, and we've instructed 320 jobs uh, to be done at this point. We've completed now 144 uh, works and there's 100 uh, underway at the moment and uh, this isn't in the stats but there's 115 demolition teams working in the red zone at the moment so that, that's a fair number. Uh, particularly when you compare that to the infrastructure that Roger just mentioned. <coughs> Cashel Mall, all, all work there is uh, progressing on plan, not expecting any delays from demolition point on the restart there, uh, so that's progressing at a very good rate and I know a number of you have seen that already. Uh, there's about 1,500 traffic movements in and out of the red zone each day and I think now that there could be as many as four or 500 people in there at any one point in time. Uh, Clarendon, we're still working with the owner and the insurer on that, uh, and discussions are progressing. That, that's about as much as I can they say at the moment. Right. No, they are. They Absolutely, are. yes. No question. It's a daily topic of conversation. I mean, it is. Yeah. It's a key corner. Yeah, it's a very key corner. You want key, it down. key building. Yeah, you want it down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's still our stance at this stage. No question. Mm. Thanks, Minister. Um, EQC are obviously continuing with our inspection process uh, across Canterbury. Uh, to date, as a result of the February event, we've completed 43,238 full inspections, uh, those being triaged on the back of the 180,000 rapid inspections that we completed. Uh, we currently have 220 teams in the field uh, working on a number of different assi assignments, including supporting CERA, uh, land inspections in the Port Hills and obviously the Green Zone trying to keep work um, rolling through to Fletcher's. Contents numbers continue to increase. We received another 1,300 contents claims this week. Um, of the 128,747 contents claims received for February, uh, we still require information from claimants on 78,200 of those. In the last two weeks, we've received 1,800 schedules uh, relating to those claims. From the September event, we still have um, 3,000 of the 54,000 contents claims received to settle. A thousand of those relate to documentation that we're awaiting from claimants to settle them. 2,000 relate to homes in the red zone that we're awaiting demolition um, confirmation from insurers. Uh, we'll be continuing, continuing to work through the green zone and supporting Sarah and the white zone over the next couple of weeks.